Hello, good morning, Atamarie, Tenatato Katoa. Welcome to the Financial Services Council 2020 Conference, Generations. I'm Vanya Thomas from Guardian Trust, and I'll be your MC today. I hope you're sitting comfortably with your beverage of choice this morning, as we have three fantastic sessions on offer over the next hour. And I hope you've all taken a few minutes to wander around the portal and familiarise yourselves with the programme, as well as the sponsor and Tech Alley areas. There's a real wealth of information on the sponsor portals available to view and download, as well as key contacts. If you have any questions about the event, please email events at fsc.org.nz and the events team will be in touch. Of course, many of us wish we could be together in person rather than digitally, but we're sure the calibre of the content will blow you away regardless. We encourage you to submit questions for the panels and speakers. This is your opportunity to engage with leaders in the industry, political heavy hitters, and other inspiring individuals. And with that, it's about time we went to our breakfast breakout sessions. Enjoy your session of choice, whether that is hearing from the Women in Super Super Panel, the innovative fintechs battling it out for a spot on the main plenary, or the Leduca sessions, which takes a look at the expanded view of the New Zealand risk landscape. Enjoy and matewa. Kia ora. Good morning and welcome. Firstly, um, I am very, very, very happy to um, be one of the first sessions, or I'll be able to host one of the first sessions. Um, and in this difficult landscape that we're currently in, um, I'm glad that we are able to get together and have a discussion um, about financial services, and in particular, in our session, um, underwriting and claims. So um, I'm very, very thankful for the FSC uh, for being able to host us, and um, I'm glad that we are able to have the opportunity to deliver um, great content. Um, so I'm glad that everyone got up early. Um, as we said in the in the beginning video, I'm glad. I hope you have a coffee and something um, nice to eat for breakfast while we discuss um, income protection and some of the difficulties that we have had um, over in Australia and some of the issues that we. I might be experiencing in New Zealand and some strategic ways that we can um, approach um, the income protection or disability cover problem. Um, so um, again, welcome and good morning. Um, we have a great panel of speakers today um, that have um, thankfully woken up at uh, five o'clock in the morning to come and join us from Sydney, Australia. Um, we have Shane Burdak, under, Senior Underwriting Consultant, uh, Sam Forty, um, who is the claims manager, and Kimberly Robertson, who is a product solutions leader at Swiss Re. So um, thank you, Swiss Re, for um, joining us today as well um, to deliver this presentation. Um, so as everyone may be aware, um, and um, we have um, discussed this panel uh, well, we've discussed the subject in, in, in length previously, um, but it is good to get um, a, a look at the reinsurance landscape in Australia um, when it comes to disability and income protection products um, and some of the difficulties um, that um, has arisen from there. So without further ado, I will hand to Kimberly Robinson, who will um, kick the session off um, just as um, a housekeeping rule. Uh, well, not a rule, but um, we do have a Q&A session, um, sorry, a Q&A function. So any questions, um, please um, pull them through and I will um, push it through to the panel at the end of the session. So over to you, Kimberly. Thanks, Chris. Kia ora, everyone. We wanted to start by extending a warm welcome to all of you and to say thank you to the FSC for having us here today. We did want to say that we don't work full time in the Australian market, in the New Zealand market, uh, and so we respect the fact that you are the experts. If you do hear something in this presentation that's not fully accurate, then please feel free to contact us because we would love to learn. 
Today, what we're hoping to do is to highlight the magnitude of the income protection issue within Australia and the significance of the changes that are being made. We're also hoping to uncover the similarities and differences in the market that either suggest that the New Zealand market is going down a similar path or alternatively, where there might be protections inbuilt within the products or underwriting and claims practices. We also want to highlight the importance of claims and underwriting professionals feeding into product conversations and decisions. We're seeking to highlight some of the pitfalls in claims and underwriting and also product practices that you should look out for. Uh, and these are more important irrespective of your level. They could actually be more important for the junior underwriters and claims assessors that are assessing cases on a daily basis. And finally, we will finish on considerations for the future of income protection that claims, underwriting and product professionals can bring to the table as many companies start to rethink income protection. Now, the following is a quote that Jeff Summerhays made. So Jeff Summerhays is an executive director at APRA. Uh, that's Australia's prudential regulator. And in terms of the market in Australia, they play a very similar role to the Reserve Bank in New Zealand. Now, he stated that the fear of first mover disadvantage has proven to be an insurmountable barrier to them being insurers, making the necessary changes to income protection. And so we'd really like you to think about whether this statement is relevant for the New Zealand market. So what's actually happened in Australia to lead to APRA intervening on income protection? Firstly, we've suffered losses on individual income protection at an unsustainable level. These losses have equaled around $3 billion over five years on one product line. Now, importantly, that does exclude group insurance. Factors contributing to these losses include an increasing focus on sales volumes over profitability, now, this is something that you might expect as a market does contract. We've further been cross-subsidising income protection, as this is the product that financial advisors lead with in terms of their advice discussions with consumers. So it's the most important one. And this is further underpinned by a fiercely competitive marketplace. We've also slowly crept away from sound risk principles in multiple areas. In some cases, we are providing customers with more benefit on claim than they earned before claiming. We've also seen underwriting practices become an area where insurers are actually competing, and this is much less common throughout Asia. Now, Sam, I'm wondering if you could briefly talk through the claims management pressures. Yeah, certainly. Uh, thank you, Kimberly. Um, I think these are uh, best summarised into three main categories. Uh, so firstly, we have the external pressures. So in particular, uh, media and regulatory pressures. So they've been immense since 2016 with various mainstream media takedowns of the industry focused on claims practices and various regulatory reports and measures imposed with a heavy claims management focus, culminating in the Royal Commission and the key recommendation out of this for claims handling to now come under the eye of the consumer watchdog ASIC. So looking to the New Zealand market, uh, these external pressures don't seem to be, have been as intense, but they've definitely still been present and they seem to be on the increase. So secondly, we've, uh, we've had staffing pressures. So we've had turnover at senior management level at all major insurers and significant vacancies across the assessor level across the industry. Again, I don't think this turnover has been quite as intense in the New Zealand market, but it's definitely still present. So thirdly, uh, uh, the limited tools that are available to claims professionals. So one of the most important tools for a claims assessor is the policy wording they're assessing to. And we'll go, go into more detail today around how we can move away from the nonsensical product definitions that claims assessors are, are currently working with to definitions that support true disablement and better, better encourage a return to work. One of the other tools is the ability for insurers to pay for treatment to assist with the rehabilitation process, which in the, the Australian uh, industry has been lobbying to for no avail for a few years now. And this is definitely somewhere where the New Zealand market is better placed. Thanks, Sam. So compounding all of this, we've had a rapidly evolving regulatory environment we have had best interest duty uh, as compared to the New Zealand legislation of better off. Uh, now the average risk statement of advice is taking an advisor at least 10 to 16 hours to prepare and starts at around 60 pages long. 
Uh, we've also seen AFCA, which is our ombudsman, taking more liberal interpretations post the Banking and Finance Royal Commission. Uh, in addition to this, both ASIC and APRA have been significantly more active post the Royal Commission. And there's also some friction that the industry is experiencing as to how we can make uh, contracts more attractive to consumers whilst also making them uh, more sustainable or increasing profitability. So what has APRA actually done? Uh, the first thing is that they have banned the sale of agreed value policies. Uh, my clicker appears to be stuck. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Great, thank you. Uh, so what has APRA done? Firstly, they've banned the sale of agreed value policies. Uh, now that is effective March, 2020. Uh, APRA has also imposed a capital charge on insurers and that will be re-evaluated next year, depending on the changes that insurers have actually made. They've also suggested that pre-disability income should be based on the immediate 12 months prior to claim. And they've reduced the replacement ratio to a flat 70%. So that's news, Justin, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and interesting, they've, interestingly, they've also allowed a total replacement ratio of 90% for the first six months. So that one again is hot off the press. They've introduced also a set of measure, measures that should occur at the five year mark of a policy. Insurers will need to occupationally and financially re-underwrite the life insured and make any changes to the policy that should be appropriate to maintain uh, sustainability of the product going forward. Now, APRA have commented that the insurers have partially created this problem by having poor data. We cannot easily pinpoint features in the product that are performing badly, uh, and we also can't track new features that we're adding and their specific impacts to profitability as compared to the rest of the products. Uh, now, next slide, please. Where are we in New Zealand? I'm guessing that you are wondering at this point, is anything actually similar? Now, we know uh, at an anecdotal level that market data is difficult to obtain for New Zealand, uh, and insurers tell us that their data could use some work. Um, now, one thing that is consistent on both sides of the Tasman is the decrease in the 10-year government bond rates uh, over around 10 years has directly increased premiums by about 20%. Uh, now, that one comes to us from the Actuaries Institute. We've also seen claims incidents and durations rise whilst terminations deteriorate. We've seen pressures increase on ACC uh, and naturally that puts more pressure on the private sector. It also appears that some products do not conform to the principle of indemnity, and that is that a higher benefit could be paid to the insured than the loss that is actually suffered by the customer. I've also heard some people in New Zealand uh, comment that it is different as the Reserve Bank has no product intervention powers. But it is worth noting that their powers are actually not dissimilar to the Australian market, uh, and both are able to impose a capital charge. Now with that, I will hand to Shane to talk through what's in a replacement ratio. So next slide. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, in its simplest form, a, an income protection policy replacement ratio can be defined simply as the insured benefit over the applicant's insurable earnings. There's been a lot of focus here in Australia on the replacement ratio and what the actual number should be with some believing the number should be as low as 60% in order to provide sufficient incentive for uh, any claimant to be able to return to work. In reality, the replacement ratio calculations are, are a lot more complicated than this simple formula. Uh, since a claimant has, has access to a multiple uh, array of, of post-disability income and benefits. In, in addition to the benefit paid under an income protection policy, or the insured benefit, a claimant can draw other income, uh, ancillary payments and, and other insurance such as ACC and, and TPD covers. And these are sources of, of income that are available to a claimant and, and really complicate the replacement ratio formula. And we'll be looking at these today. So, so let's start by looking at the denominator of our formula or what we mean by insurable earnings. Next slide, if we can, please. 
I don't want to get bogged down at all on those uh, two columns there on the left of your slide today. Um, it, this isn't an underwriting uh, or a claims uh, financial analysis interpretation session. Session. Well, what I do want to just point out here is that we we do separate a true arm's length employee from a self-employed person or a business owner as an applicant because the business owner has a greater opportunity to remunerate themselves through a range of um, benefits that may be paid through their business. And you'll see we've highlighted there on those bottom of those two columns, the warning that in both situations, if care is not taken during the underwriting process, with things like how we treat overtime, how much we add back, uh, bonuses, respective share of profits from a business, the replacement ratio may well be exceeded. And of course, we also know that the IP product itself contains a scaling ratio. If you can just move to the uh, the next uh, piece of that slide, thanks. It, it, it contains a, a scaling ratio for high income earners dependent upon whether the benefit is indemnity or agreed value in nature. And, and this also directly reflects the respective tax treatment from New Zealand's Inland Revenue Department. So if we change focus and move into the next slide, thanks, uh, from, from current state of play to a future state, it's, it's fair for us to say that we don't believe there's too much broken with regard the, the underwriting approach to calculating insurable earnings as we've roughly set out there on, on the, uh, the left-hand column of your slide. But we probably need to call out the following exceptions. If, if KiwiSaver Super from an employer are to be insured under an income protection policy, despite the fact that it only requires a contribution of, of 3% of an employee's salary, it's important from our perspective that this is done under a rider benefit built into the policy, which stipula stipulates that the Kiwi super payments in the event of a claim will only be paid to a Kiwi Savers fund and, and not directly into the hands of the claimant. The other caveat is that the product income replacement ratio, whatever we decide that number should be, and at Swiss Re, we believe that a maximum of 75% is reasonable and sustainable as long as any payment under a policy does not exceed the level at any time during claim under any circumstances. What also needs to be highlighted is the number of product and risk management legacies as per column two there on the slide that are similar to those that we see in Australia. These have been detrimental in their application, particularly when you see these play out in the claims management space. And without a doubt, these have con contributed to the extremely poor overall income protection product profitability on our side of the Tasman, and hence they need to be flagged for the New Zealand market. I, I won't work through these individually because we'll cover most of those as we uh, go through the session today. So, so we briefly looked at the denominator aspect of the income replacement formula being insurable earnings. Let's then move to uh, the nu numerator of the formula being other income and, and have a look at how this is handled from a risk management perspective in Australia relative to the New Zealand market. So we can move to the next slide, thanks. Now, disappointingly, you'll see there the Australian market handles these other forms of income quite poorly. And, and you can see that from the slide, it's basically all red. We, we essentially ignore an applicant's investment income position as well as their net worth, as, as you'll see from the top left and right of the slide there. Concurrent TPD cover is totally ignored in underwriting, yet we know that a large TPD payout can well and truly supplement an individual's ongoing long-term income protection benefit. And finally, we generally do our best to underwrite out poor risks at time of policy inception for potential ongoing business, um, as well as sick leave. But this is never an easy exercise from an underwriting perspective, and, and it merely represents a snapshot only in current time and consequently then, therefore has limited protective value. How does the New Zealand market compare then? Next slide, thanks. Well, you'll actually see from that slide that there's some green and amber here, which is certainly a better position than what we see in Australia. And on a positive side, New Zealand are currently asking applicants about their investment income and companies are making sure monthly benefit adjustments are made where an investment income exceeds 20% of personal exertion income or thereabouts, which we think is a very prudent practice. Some companies in New Zealand, but again, not all from what we can see, have a built-in policy offset clause that states that the benefit payable at claim 
will actually be offset by any continuing business income being received during disablement, which is a very prudent. Similarly, from what we can see, most New Zealand companies have, have built in an offset clause for ACC payments, but this doesn't seem to equally extend for mortgage protection and also for key person income protection coverage. And the sick leave provisions and how this is managed seems to also vary by company in New Zealand and also the product series. Levels of TPD cover are not considered a point of underwriting in all in New Zealand, just like in Australia, and this is definitely a red flag for all of us. Additionally, there appears to be some inconsistencies in the New Zealand market with the treatment of mortgage covers and key person IP covers that are written concurrently with traditional personal income protection policies. And in, the New and in New Zealand, the approach to high net worth individuals, which is certainly slightly better than Australia, is arguably, arguably still too light at this point in time. So where would we like to see the market positioned with regard to these other sources of, of income? If we can go to the next slide, thanks. If offsets are, are built into an income protection policy for ongoing business income, ACC, sick leave, and any other form of disability support pension payments, this will be a major step in the right direction. Continuing to consider investment income as the New Zealand market currently does, and adjusting income protection monthly benefits where investment income levels exceed thresholds such as a 20%, is prudent. We need to ask and be familiar with an applicant's net asset position for all risks written, not just for risks that exceed 15,000 or the 20,000 a month that applies in, in, a, in the Australian market. Furthermore, the, the current underwriting philosophy of ignoring someone's net asset levels unless it exceeds $5 million, excluding the value of the applicant's residence also needs to be reviewed. Imposing some form of restriction or adjustment on the financial underwriting calculations at much lower net, net asset position levels has to be considered to reduce overall the opportunity for a claimant to either restructure or even liquidate these assets during a claim. Um, our, our product design and risk management practices must ensure that there remains sufficient incentive for a claimant to want to return to work. Setting much more realistic net asset uh, points um, tier to say the relevant key life cycle age brackets make sense, um, such as if we take an applicant under age 45, perhaps imposing those restrictions on income protection where their net assets are greater than say $1 million, remembering we're excluding primary residents here. For age 46 to 55 applicants, we could perhaps set a, a net asset trigger point of $1.5 or $2 million. And for an applicant greater than 55, somewhere in the range of two to $3 million. And some might argue that these numbers that I've just thrown out there are, are still too light. And finally, we must start to somehow consider what levels of other existing morbidity covers are in place, both existing mortgage and income protection key person covers, as well as existing TPD cover, particularly for long-term income protection policies. One option might be to treat any existing TPD cover um, over a certain threshold, to keep it simple, if we, if we want to do that for the moment, to, a, to say a figure that's flat of, of $1 million TPD cover. So where an existing TPD cover hits or exceeds the $1 million, we actually treat the TPD benefit as if it were a five-year benefit period IP type policy and offset this amount against any DI benefit or income protection benefit being offered at point of underwriting. Concurrent TPD cover held in conjunction with income protection cover just has to be addressed in some way. More prudent consideration is also required to ensure there is no doubling up or overlap of different forms of IP cover in the New Zealand market. So, so in summary here, we've got a, a lot of thinking to do to, to really ensure we have a far greater risk control in place to protect against these very real additional income threats at claim stage. Sam, I'll, I'll hand over to you now to explore the disability definitions in both markets. Yeah, thanks, Shane. Um, it's at this point, I, I probably have to disclose that I, I can't see the slides at all. So I'm going to need a, a little bit of a hand from, uh, from you guys if, if we are on the, on the wrong slide. So um, if you can just let me know. But hopefully we can see a, a picture of uh, Uluru at the moment on the, on the slide, and we're looking at the, uh, the total disability uh, definition in the Australian market. 
So if we first look at the Australian market, we see that the competitive pressures have led to all major insurers adopting a relatively standard three-tier total disability definition. And as the title suggests, arguably this doesn't represent what the lay person would expect with a, a customer considered totally disabled if they're either, and I emphasise the, uh, the word either, unable to perform one important duty of their regular occupation and not working, unable to work more than 10 hours per week in their regular occupation, or unable to generate more than 20% of their pre-disablement earnings. And the small caveat there that they need to be under the care of, uh, of a doctor. If we can now uh, go to the next slide, please. So when we do our comparison with the New Zealand market, uh, there may not be one standard definition, but there's definitely some common features across the market and they're very similar to the Australian market. So just generally customers are considered totally disabled when they're unable to perform one important duty of their regular occupation. And concernedly here, uh, we've seen definitions that only require them to not be working in their regular occupation, which means they can still be working in another occupation. So similarly, the 10 hour rule is a, a common feature in the, in the product and perhaps of concern again, there's a more generous earnings allowance uh, where a customer can be allowed to earn up to 25% of their pre-disabled earnings and still be considered totally disabled. Now I'd li like to highlight the pitfalls that claims teams can be faced with when attempting to help return a customer to work with a few examples of aspects of these definitions that can act as a financial disincentive to a customer transitioning from total disablement to partial disablement and then hopefully off claim. So if we can please go to the, uh, the next slide. And again, relying on the team to let me know if uh, we're not on the right slide here, but uh, hopefully we, we're titled the issue with a graduated return to work earnings tier. So the first example we have uh, focuses on the earnings tier of the total disability definition. And as I just mentioned in the Australian market, this allows a customer to earn up to 20% of their predisciplinary earnings and receive a full total disability benefit. So here in the example, we have a customer with a $10,000 per month pre disablement earnings and a $7,500 sum insured. So they return to work earning $2,000 a month and they'll still be considered totally disabled and be entitled to receive a $7,500 total disability benefit. So they have a combined uh, income replacement ratio of 95%. Now, per a graduated return to work plan, uh, if they were to increase their hours and their earnings by uh, to $2,500, they'd actually be $1,375 worse off as their replacement ratio drops from 95% to 81%. And they'll actually not be financially better off until they're earning more than 80% of their pre disablement earnings. That's per uh, a fairly standard uh, partial disability formula in the Australian market. If we go to the, uh, the next slide or the, or the transition, we see the New Zealand flag down the bottom, hopefully. Uh, so we've got a very similar example here. Um, but uh, instead, uh, we can have an initial combined replacement ratio in the New Zealand market up to 100% as with that 25% uh, earnings allowance, where someone can still be considered totally disabled and the customer potentially um, will be even worse off as they transition to being partially disabled. So here uh, we've got uh, earnings increasing by $500 a month and the customer, as they go to partial disability from total disability, they'll actually be $1,750 worse off and their combined replacement ratio would drop from 100% to 82.5%. And they won't get back to the same financial pos position until they're uh, they're earning their full predisciplinary earnings. If we can please go to the, uh, the next slide again. So we see the issue with the graduated return to work, uh, the hours tier. So the next example is focused on the hours tier or what's commonly referred to as the 10 hour rule. And it's equally relevant for both markets. Here we have a customer in a similar situation, but in this case, the customer is self-employed and certified as unfit to work up to uh, as fit to work up to 10 hours per week. And with some savvy business, business restructuring, they're able to earn up to 50% of their pre disablement earnings. As they're still considered totally disabled, they can receive a, a full total disability benefit. They'd have a combined replacement ratio on an indemnity benefit of 125%. Now, in this case, if they were to increase their hours by five hours per week, perhaps with a 10% increase in earnings, 
they'd be three and a half thousand dollars worse off with their combined replacement ratio dropping to 90 percent the customer will likely always be worse off when they're uh than when they were working 10 hours per week and we wonder why claims professionals see so many uh, claimants that are unable to work for more than 10 hours per week so just one tip for uh, any claims professionals in the uh in the audience here uh, is to focus on the ability and capacity for work as opposed to the self-reported hours worked. Too often we see full benefits being paid just because someone reports that they haven't worked more than 10 hours per week. If we go to the, uh, the next slide, please, uh, we should see the issue with the graduated return to work duties tier. So I've deliberately uh, left this example of the one important duty uh, tier um, uh, again, common in both markets until last, as we commonly hear suggestions that this tier of the definition is non-problematic and should remain in future income replacement products. But we know it's not without its problems, uh, which we'll highlight in this example. So here, we, again, we've got, uh, we've got a customer who's able to perform uh, all but one important duty, and this customer elects to stay off work and receive their full total disability benefit, which under most total disability definitions, they're able to do. As 12 months passes on, uh, they've remained off work, but then in this case, they're medically assessed as able to perform all the important duties, so they no longer meet the total disability definition. After a prolonged period off work and minimal employer contact, they're now unemployed, they struggle to re-enter the workforce, uh, and the customer has no income, comes to press, lodges a new claim, and it's not a good uh, situation for the customer, obviously, and not a good situation for the insurer. If we can now move to the next slide, we'd like to highlight some considerations for a future state. And as the title suggests, there's an element of back to the future here with a tightening of the definitions similar to the definitions we've seen in both markets previously, and we still see in other markets that don't seem to have the profitability issues. So importantly, we need a total disability definition that represents someone truly unable to work. And if they have the capacity or are already working, they shouldn't be considered totally disabled. As such, we'd suggest when a claimant is unable to perform the material and substantial duties of their occupation and not working in any capacity, they should be considered totally disabled. Duties should be based on the standard duties of their occupation as opposed to job-specific duties. And there's potential to align with duties disclosed at the time of underwriting, minimising occupational creep. Rehab support needs to be incorporated into the core disability wording around how an insurer may assist the claimant in their return to health or work journey to improve the expectations here. As mentioned earlier, in the New Zealand market, the New Zealand market's ahead here in being able to pay for treatment, which is something the Australian market has been lobbying for a few years now. Now, we propose a tightening of the generous concessions in the definition to those that are unemployed at the time of claim, reverting to an any occupation ETE definition for a limited period, and then some form of work activities definition. For those insurers offering a lump sum TPD option within their income replacement product, uh, this should be assessed under an any occupation definition to indemnify actual expected financial loss. We can't have the situations where we see a claimant receive a very large payout and they can continue to work in a different occupation sometimes without actually a, a, a loss being suffered. Now, Shane mentioned it before, but we need to restore the standard offset provisions in our policy wordings, most, notice, most notably ACC, but also other uh, income uh, replacement style products such as key person cover and mortgage replacement covers. There's also potential for a change in the definition to an any occupation uh, style definition at the 12 or the 24 month mark of claim. Although we're not convinced this is absolutely necessary in baseline income replacement products with the appropriate tightening of all the other risk controls that we've already mentioned. If we can now uh, go to the next slide, please. So if we uh, again rely on the, the team to let me know if we're, we're not where we should be, um, if we turn to our attention to partial disability, uh, and firstly, if we highlight that again in the Australian market, uh, we've got a fairly standard definition, which is simply being unable to perform, uh, unable to work at full capacity with no defined threshold. Earnings need to be less than pre-disability earnings under the care of a doctor. And day one partial is, is quite standard in the market with no requirement to be totally disabled prior. 
And if we just uh, click the button for the transition, um, we'll see that the partial disability um, uh, formula is also quite standard in the market. So if we compare to the New Zealand market, if we go to the, the next slide, please, hopefully we're, we're good, yep. Um, so when we compare to the New Zealand market, again, there's no standard partial disability definition. However, some common features exist, some of which are more risk adverse than the Australian market, which is good to see. So many definitions have a defined threshold of disability or a defined threshold of loss of earnings with maximum earnings allowed um, being 75% which enables better finalisation of long-term partials where a customer is working close to full capacity. Day one partial also doesn't appear quite as common, uh, but it's definitely still prevalent in the market. The partial disability formulas, if we can just hit the, the, uh, the transition, the partial disability formulas also contain a little more variety, but pleasingly the variations to the Australian market would typically result in a lower benefit being paid and thus a lower uh, combined replacement ratio. Now, if we consider the most important component of partial definitions being defined, uh, defining capacity, and in particular, what a customer's full capacity is, it's important to note the underwriting considerations that impact on the sustainability of someone's work capacity. And for this, I might hand over to Shane. Thanks, Sam. Uh, look, factors such as the number of hours per week worked, as well as the number of weeks per year are really important here, as well as having a good understanding of the applicant's occupational duties and key job responsibilities. Uh, there's little to no difference to how these risks are treated between Australia and New Zealand, being um, an insurer certainly will ask an applicant at, at time of uh, application for the number of hours that they are working per week and the weeks per year. I, I should also highlight here that there are also product rules in play that require an applicant to be working a minimum number of hours. In Australia, it's, it's 20 hours a week and uh, to, be, to be eligible for income protection cover. In New Zealand, that's varying somewhere between 20 to 25 hours per week to be eligible. With regard to the maximum hours worked a week, both sides of the Tasman generally allow an applicant cover for IP where they indicate they're working up to and including 60 hours per week. And from an occupational perspective, we certainly do not capture any real history in our personal statements like we once used to. Um, additionally, we, we, we could all, uh, also argue here that we don't get sufficient or granular enough information at point of underwriting regarding an applicant's current role and key job responsibilities. And, and this raises questions such as, as you'll see there on the, on the right of your slide, is 60 hours a week sustainable for someone over the long term? What is the actual impact that is you know, on one's overall mental health well, wellness? How can we effectively underwrite and assess occupational risk if we don't really know the individual's key job responsibilities. If we accept business on an unsustainable number of work hours over the long term, we'll be inevitably over-insuring applicants. Our current occupational approach lends itself to occupational creep with, with applicants being charged lower occupational loadings relative to the risk of morbidity from the actual duties that they do. And, and really, if we roll all this up into one question, what is the overall claim management impact of all, all of this? I, I probably should qualify here at this point that whilst the discussion at the moment is in the context of partial disability, these underwriting considerations are equally applicable and problematic for a total disability scenario. Sam, can you walk us through some claims examples that perhaps highlight these factors and, and that can be problematic? Yeah, sure. Uh, Thanks, Shane. I think by this stage, you've, uh, you've likely realised that I love a good example, so I'm going to use a couple more to highlight some of the issues with the current uh, partial disability construct. So we should hopefully have the partial problem child number one on the screen here. So here we've got a 40-year-old lawyer at the time of underwriting, discloses working 60 hours per week, earning $200,000 a year. And as Shane's described, this would be allowed at the time of underwriting with a monthly benefit of 12500 on an indemnity basis. So two years later, um, she's now working 70 hours per week and suffers a breakdown. She's diagnosed with an adjustment disorder, which is a mental health condition. After a brief period off work and appropriate treatment, she's able to return to work part-time. And under the guidance of a wonderful case manager and her treating GP, uh, she successfully adheres to a graduated return to work plan. 
And at this point, it's looking like a good news story and we can all get the champagne ready. But despite making great progress, her GP states that she can never return to pre-claim work hours as it's not good for her health and will likely lead to burnout. Now, the outcome here, whilst uh, perhaps dependent on the actual partial disability definition and whether there's, there's a threshold of hours allowed to work, we likely have a partial claim for the next 25 years on an age 65 benefit period. If we go to the, uh, the next slide now, um, we should have partial problem child number two. And the next uh, partial problem child highlights some similar themes, but also highlights the issue with day one partial and how this opens us up to backdated partial claims. So in this case, we've got a 40 year old self-employed uh, IT consultant at the time of underwriting discloses working 55 hours per week, earning $120,000 a year. Three years later, reports to have not been working to full capacity for the last 18 months. Now he suffered a decline in income, but this also happens to coincide with the loss of a key contract. Doctor supports that he's not been working to full capacity for the last 18 months. He's, the insurer has to backdate his claim 18 months and pay partial disability benefits per the relevant formula, even though the loss of income is driven more by the loss of, uh, of a key contract. Now, market conditions make securing another key contract challenging. And with doctor's support, again, we would likely have an ongoing partial claim. Now, at this point, I'm going to hand back over to Shane to see how we can make some changes at the time of underwriting that might help us here, particularly for problem child number one. Thanks, Sam. Look, um, we, we can certainly revisit whether 60 hours a week is a reasonable number of hours to be accepting income protection business on. Look, one way might be to consider continuing to accept business up to this level, but pro ratering our income calculations to a reduced level that might be earned for, say, 50 hours a week worked. That is, in our example uh, that you can see there on the slide, an applicant who states that they work 60 hours a week and earn, say, $100,000 per annum, we could pro rata that income so we establish what would be earned working a 50 hour week and, and for example, take five six of the disclosed $100,000. Um, we would then apply the usual maximum 75% income replacement ratio for an, for an indemnity policy to the reduced $84,000 income level to arrive at the insured benefit. From an occupational perspective, we need to continue to decline applicants for income protection cover who work excess, excessive hours. These people are a poor morbidity risk over the long term and there's plenty of let, literature to actually support this. If we don't believe we're obtaining sufficient information at the point of application to, to accurately assess an, an occupation, then we can either build out the personal statement uh, question set further um, or to achieve what we need, we can perhaps even ask for a copy of the applicant's job description and their key roles and responsibilities at the time of application. Uh, Sam, I'll hand back to you to comment from a claims future state perspective, if you can. Yeah, thanks, Shane. Um, so the key message here is that partial is important as it acts as a powerful product feature which should encourage customers to recover at work and realise the health benefits of good work. So I'm very passionate about this and we feel this uh, aligns strongly to the mission statement that we sign up to as signatories to the health benefits of good work. However, we need to make some changes to the contract which will be uh, more significant for some insurers compared to where, uh, uh, depending on where your current definition sits. So partial disability needs to work effectively with the total disability de definition. And as soon as uh, return to work occurs or is um, someone's able to return to work, they, they need to be considered partial. A period of total disablement in the waiting period is an important uh, mitigant to the backdated partial problem child claim that we saw with the uh, problem child number two. Uh, particularly those uh, cases that are influenced by external factors. However, again, again, consistent with being signatories to the health benefits of good work, we're cognizant that forcing people off work in order to claim is also not in the best interest of our customers. So I believe there's potential to waive this total disability and requirement from the date of notification to help encourage early notification and enable early intervention, rehab and recovery. Now, we mentioned it before, is it, it's important there's a threshold of disability, perhaps 20 to 25%, which as mentioned uh, is present in some but not all current policy wordings in the New Zealand market. 
This helps prevent those lingering partial claims that continue on and on when someone's working close to full capacity. This can be done by capping the earnings or potentially capping hours with benefits ceasing when someone returns to close to full-time hours or full-time uh, earnings, which are, uh, are demonstrated in the, gra in the graphical representations at the bottom of the slide here. Now, tightening of the, the pre-disablement earnings definition to 12 months immediately prior to claim will help to avoid being able to go back in time to find one outlier of a boom year that helps bump up the partial disability benefit. Now, again, the, the definition needs to encourage and set expectations for rehab in the core wording, but not necessarily mandate rehab, as we know that using rehab as a stick doesn't foster the best return to work results. And we should also consider a capacity to work clause, which is commonly referred to as a deeming clause, where benefits are calculated using expected earnings based on capacity for work, as opposed to actual reduced earnings that may be due to motivational or external factors. Now I'm going to hand over to uh, Kimberly to summarise the, the key messages of today's session. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so before we take you to the Q&A, again, we're wanting to go through the key messages. Uh, so we believe that uh, key elements within the product need to be addressed concurrently with underwriting and claims practices. The profitability challenge is the sum of all parts. And so we do need to focus on replacement ratios, total disablement definition and partial disablement definition. So within the replacement ratio, uh, we need to ask every applicant about their net asset position. And we also need to take appropriate underwriting action at set trigger points in addition to asking their investment income. We should also expand or in some cases reintroduce offsets for sick leave, ongoing business income and other insurances. We should also take a closer look uh, in the interaction with lump sum covers. In terms of the total disablement definition, we feel that a better definition would be to head towards the inability to perform material and substantial duties as we feel the current definition is unsustainable. We also think that ACC offsets should apply for all products. Uh, so this will include key person income uh, and mortgage replacement style products. And significantly with partial disablement, we need to reconsider the maximum number of hours that we need to accept at both an underwriting or policy level. We also need to gain a better understanding of key occupational tasks. And this is particularly critical at the underwriting stage. We further need to look at the ability to encourage customers to recover at work. Now, this is a really, really powerful product feature. We do know that the New Zealand market currently is looking very closely at income protection and the FSC has set up a working group. So we wanted to remind all of you, especially those at all levels of underwriting and claims, that you and your teams play an incredibly important role in feeding into product discussions. As an industry, we really need to ensure that these products can continue to make a difference in the lives of everyday New Zealanders now and into the future. And with that, I'll hand back to Chris to do the Q&A. Perfect. Um, thank you all very much for um, a very, very informative session um, on disability cover. Um, there are uh, a few questions that I have uh, that we have got come through, actually. Um, so um, there are a few, I guess, pressure points here that have demonstrated why we are in the position we are in for disability cover. Um, if we look at the immediate, what do you think are the issues that we need to address sooner rather than later? Or is there kind of equal pressure from all sides um, when it comes to disability cover? Uh, it's a good question. So I think for us, uh, it is the totality of the issue. So certainly there are some levers that you can pull sooner than others into products. So I think uh, underwriting and claims practices might be a bit easier to adjust than products in terms of impacting product scores. Uh, however, I think what you'll find is that by changing underwriting and claims practices alone, it's not going to change um, the profitability significantly, like the product itself needs mm. to change. And similarly, the way in which we discuss uh, these products with advisors at the distribution channel needs to uh, adjust slightly. Excellent. Um, and so um, this is probably more a, a, a question for, for Sam um, or even Sam and Shane as well, but um, from a claims perspective, what is the data indicating as the main claims pressure when it comes to disability cover? I mean, industry-wide, we hear anecdotally 
um, are things that have been published in white papers and things that have been uh, discussed in the industry like longer wait periods, age 65 payment terms, secondary mental health claims, occupational creep. What is your view on where the main pressures are when it comes to um, claims on disability cover? Sam, I'll Yeah, that's a... Uh... Yeah, thanks, Shane. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chris. That's a uh, it's a it's a really good question, actually, and uh, and I think you touched on a, a couple of the, the the things at the end there. Um, the first thing I'd probably lead off in saying is that um, we have, as as an industry, um, both in the Australian and New Zealand market, we actually have poor oversight of the the, the at a real granular level. What's, uh, what's causing some of the issues. And that's something that uh, in the Australian market, APRA has been quite damning of the industry over. So to pinpoint it to, um, you know, at a real granular level to say that, you know, um, a certain product feature is causing us an issue, we have, you know, poor quality data there. But I think there's some real common themes that have definitely come out. We know that mental health claims have, have been on the increase. And we know that they have really poor termination experience. So we know that they, they, they last for a very long duration and they cost insurers a, a lot of money. So that's definitely one of the, one of the themes. Um, you mentioned it before, long wait uh, periods are, are also something that's um, that's been problematic uh, and had poor experience. But likewise, the really short waiting periods uh, or no waiting periods have also had um, very poor experience. Um, so we, we focus mainly on the individual um, disability market uh, here. And there's been, um, I think uh, Kimberly mentioned at the start, there's been you know, really substantial losses. So I think at last count, it was, it, was, it was over $4 billion losses in the Australian market, less oversight in the New Zealand market in terms of, we know that there's been some losses, but we don't know what it is at an aggregate industry level. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a few sort of uh, common themes there. Group disability uh, in the Australian market's also been uh, problematic and has caused some losses, but not to the same extent of the individual uh, disability market. Shane, I don't know if you wanted to add anything there or Kimberly. No, look, I think you've summed that up very well, Sam. Excellent. Um, so just, uh, I guess, segueing on to um, product design. I mean, it's a really tough juggling act. Um, one, you want to provide um, the best product that you can um, and give the best outcomes to our clients. But at the same time, there's also a, um, a, a, a risk and sustainability conversation that has to go on as well to make sure that the product is sustainable. And obviously, um, from the data that we've got um, in, in Australia, um, it is um, heading to, in a direction where it's not sustainable. Um, Following the APRA um, recommendations or measures, are we seeing any different product trends um, at the moment in the Australian market or um, uh, uh, just universally all the frontline insurers um, in Australia um, just enacting the, the APRA measures? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, so I guess there's a, there's a couple of things there. At this stage, what we're not seeing is trends as such in the product because uh, insurers only got the most recent measures uh, within the last couple of weeks. Uh, however, APRA have been quite clear that their measures are a starting point. So this is a minimum bar that they're setting. Uh, what it's not is um, they're not looking for everyone just to conform to that level. They're looking for ways that we can make the product more sustainable. Uh, and, and I think what we are strongly encouraging insurers towards is uh, collecting much better data so we can actually make decisions on what is working for customers and what isn't working for customers. Um, because absolutely we know there is a critical need for the product and, and APRA have acknowledged that also. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we are there uh, for Australians and New Zealanders when they need us the most. Um, but for those people that have ability to work and, and perhaps are not uh, and are looking um, like they have some sort of capacity, we need to be able to deal with those, uh, which, which is possibly sitting at some of the higher sum insured levels. So I think in terms of Australia, you'll probably see us moving uh, next year. The deadline is sort of around the October mark. So I think you'll start seeing insurers move a bit before that uh, and possibly as early as the unfair contract terms legislation, which comes in, in April. Uh, Chris, I'm, I might jump in there really quickly to mm -hmm. just to just to give the audience some sort of uh, 
feel for what has happened here in the market. Sure. There's certainly there's certainly one insurer that I can think of, and and, and maybe more than one now that, that have very quickly moved to a position where they've said we are going to to make an alternative offer before these directives are actually in play, and and they're 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 offering what we would know uh, as as professionals as an income protection policy, but but with a maximum income replacement ratio of around 60%, for example, and none of the ancillary benefits. And, you know, that becomes a much, much cheaper product for your end customer, but they're also using it as a, as a retention tool if people are, because we all know that rates, are, uh, premium increases are having to flow through to try and grab back some of this, uh, th- these losses and, 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 and adjust there. Um, so it's being used in that fashion as well, where people are saying, well, we can't afford this anymore. Um, and they're going through the resale process of, well, you still need this and, and you're better off having something rather than, than nothing. And, and therefore there's that option. So there is certainly um, change of foot before the directives are, are actually in, in, in play. Yeah. Perfect. Um, excellent. Um, so with that, I think we will um, close out this breakfast session. Um, once again, uh, thank you very much, Kimberly, Shane and Sam for um, one delivering the session and, and doing it at such a um, ungodly hour of the morning over in Sydney, Australia. Um, so, yeah, we're very, very grateful um, for you to be on the call today. So um, uh, to the audience, I hope you got a lot out of a session um, and I sincerely hope um, that the rest of your generation's conference goes well. So Kakitiano, thank you very much. Take wow, care. what a way to start the FSC's 2020 conference. Thank you to our speakers, facilitators and Pitch Perfect contenders for being part of our breakfast sessions. It is fantastic to have such a breadth of speakers, all with their own ideas, passions and stories. If you've registered for the rest of the day, please take this opportunity to have a 10 minute break, have a stretch and a breath of fresh air before we head straight into the incredible main plenary lineup. It's gonna be a cracker. See you in 10. Hey Konera.